All right, this this will be fun. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you. As developers, we get to write software for many different areas of human endeavor. If you've been in the industry for any length of time, you've probably seen your fair share of government offices or insurance companies or academia somewhere. Now, while much of the time it seems to be lobbing crud or maybe coding yet another front end designed by Gary in accounting, occasionally we get a gem of a project. I stumbled into such a gem which was complicated enough to be interesting. Now the thing about complexity is that it should be just complicated enough and no more. Sometimes we can find ourselves wanting to dial down that complexity so that we can get a better understanding of the big complex thing we're interested in. And that's where these next two guys are going to help us out. Mythbusters was a television show on the Discovery Channel where the hosts, Adam Savage and Jamie Heineman, would use the scientific method to determine if various myths, urban legends, or movie scenes had any validity. Now the myth would be their hypothesis, and they would design experiments to classify the myth into confirmed or plausible or busted categories. Now I probably would have tried to build some sort of a machine learning system that uses Watson and Wikipedia to do the same thing, but these guys actually built something physical and set it in motion. Now you probably wouldn't use their style of scientific method if you were at a nuclear research facility, but for television it was pretty good. They spent a lot of time explaining what they were expecting to happen, how they were going to measure it, and then analyzing the results. When they had an experiment that was complicated, expensive, or dangerous, they would build a model. Now they couldn't shoot people, so they built a model of a human torso out of ballistic gel. They had a crash test dummy named Buster, uh, so that they wouldn't have to jump out of an airplane with a life raft as a parachute. San Francisco real estate being what it is, they built a shack in the desert to blow up in, with a hot water heater. They use simple models to understand complicated systems. Now, two years ago at Stir Trek, I attended a session on Azure Stream Analytics. My client at the time was in the process industry space, creating monitoring and analysis systems for industrial automation. Process Industries is the class of manufacturing that works with transforming raw materials into finished products. Think paper mills and uh, chemical refineries. So the software took measurements from the processes, calculated key performance indicators, and then displayed that information to the on-site engineers. The whole thing seemed like a batch processing nightmare. Now don't misunderstand me, that's just the way the industry uh, has grown over the years. Data transmission was expensive and there was a lot of data to transmit. So the industry had to come up with standard protocols for collecting and transferring information. Once you get standards, you get commercial products, all of which may or may not work with each other. So to me, it looked like stream processing, we could simplify that flow and remove bottlenecks. Now a big idea in industrial automation is that of the digital twin. All of the data about a physical piece of machinery is gathered together and presented as a whole. Not only operational characteristics like temperature or speed, but structural characteristics as well. Uh, things like uh, tolerances, uh, the blueprints, dimensions of the machine. When you see Tony Stark wave his hands in the air to manipulate some sort of 3D projection, he's manipulating a digital twin. Now there's three major pieces of functionality that you want from your digital twin. That's monitoring, diagnostics, and forecasting. 
Monitoring tells you what the machine is doing. Diagnostics tells you when something's wrong. And forecasting tells you what the machine's going to do sometime in the future. Now, when building models, you want to have a material that has the Play-Doh nature. Did anybody, am I the only guy who carries around Play-Doh? Do we have any Play-Doh in here? Nobody? I got a t-shirt for the guy with the Play-Doh. Oh, denied. So the Play-Doh nature just means something is accessible, versatile, and squishy. Accessible means that everyone can relate to it. It should be non-threatening, inviting, and friendly. Versatile means that you can use it for many different unrelated things. So a zoologist has used Play-Doh to position small bones that he was photographing in the field. Uh, some hacker unlocked an iPhone by making a, a print of a thumb uh, in Play-Doh. Squishy just means it's malleable. You can easily form it into whatever you envision. Node Red has the Play-Doh nature. Node Red is a flow-based programming environment for the Internet of Things. It's accessible because it uses JavaScript under the hood. I suspect that everybody here could pick up enough JavaScript in an afternoon to do whatever programming they needed to do with it. It's versatile. People hook up all kinds of things with Node Red. I've used it to expose a web API on my rover bot, and I'll probably use it on my next project, which is either a garage door opener or a furnace humidifier controller. Now finally, Node Red has the all important squishy property. If you find that you need a specialized node and you can't find one in the NPM registry, you can use JavaScript to build whatever you want. To better understand stream analytics, I build a model of a digital twin. In Node Red, you drop nodes from the toolbox onto a design surface, set some properties of the nodes, and wire the nodes together. Messages flow from node to node, where each node does some processing. Nodes can create new messages, they can read hardware signals, they can raise signals, and they can display information on screen. A typical message will have a message ID uh, that's assigned by the runtime, a topic property, and a payload property. Nodes can modify messages, clone messages, or create new messages. We'll take a stream of time-stamped values, do some calculations, and then display the result. The physical device that I'm interested in is a pump, like you might see in a chemical plant. These pumps can have any number of sensors but on them, but since this is a model, I simplified that to just one vibration sensor. Now, vibration is measured as a velocity along some axis. Think of a washing machine when it's out of balance. First it goes this way, and then it goes that way, and that back and forth is vibration, and how fast it does it is the measure that we're looking at. Now the monitoring section of this model is composed of two charts. The top chart, labeled MV, is for measured value, and that's the raw vibration signal coming from a pump. The second chart, labeled low pass, is the same signal after it's had the high frequency components removed by a low pass filter. The diagnostic section is going to consist of a gauge which displays the utilization, which is the proportion of time that the machine is in operation. If it's been on for eight out of the last 10 days, then that's an 80% utilization. Now some manufacturers of these pumps provide signals from the pump which tell you the operational status of the, of the equipment. This one doesn't have that, so we're gonna make do. For our purposes, We'll count the machine as being operational if the vibration signal is over 0.1. In the forecasting section, we'll try to track the time until failure of that pump. 
just like in the diagnostic section, we'll pick an arbitrary number and say that if the vibration goes over that level, we'll consider the pump to have failed. Now let's take a closer look at the monitoring section. This is where we would apply different digital signal processing algorithms to the stream and compare the processed result to the raw stream. Now one class of DSP algorithms are the decomposition functions. A digital signal can be decomposed into trend, seasonal, and residual components. A low pass filter removes the seasonal and residual components leaving the trend and a differencing filter removes the trend component and leaves the seasonal and residuals. Now for this project, we're interested in the trend component. In node red, these tabs are called flows and are the basic unit of abstraction. Messages travel from node to node over the interconnecting wires and each node will do something with each message and pass it along to one or more downstream neighbors. That bright blue blob on the left is a link node. Links are the mechanism by which we get messages from one flow to another. This one happens to be an input link. It is accepting messages from another flow. Now the message passes down the wire to the graph node, which is provided by the node red dashboard package. In addition to the line charts, this node can be configured to display bar charts or pie charts. This particular configuration is using the messages timestamp property for the X value and the messages payload property for the Y value. The next node we'll look at is this one labeled low pass. Notice that the link node passed the message to the MV node as well as to this low pass node. Node-RED has multiple ways of sending messages to more than one downstream node. Messages can be duplicated, like we see here, or a message can be sent down different paths based on the value of a property on the message. So sometimes you might want to send the original down one path and a modified version down another path. This low-pass filter comes from the Node-RED Node Smooth package and can be configured to apply different smoothing algorithms to the inputs. This is really handy for this model because it allows us to play with the data and we can see the changes on the charts. Finally, that low pass node sends the message to another chart node. Now this one is configured the same as the measured value chart and allows us to compare those measured value to the filtered value. Now one of the neat things about the chart node, or one of the many neat things, is that you can send two data streams to a single chart and the chart will plot both streams. So there's a couple of interesting things going on here. The first is how messages flow from node to node, but the more interesting thing is the user community around node red. There's 1500 packages in the NPM registry that all have the node red, red contrib path. Now the entire functionality of this part of the model was built with out of the box nodes and a couple of packages from the registry. In the diagnostic section, we're going to measure the utilization of the pump. Remember that we consider the pump to be running if the vibration signal is above 0.1. That 0.1 is totally arbitrary and simply reflects the fact that my fake data was normalized. Here we see that low pass filter again and then another dashboard node which renders a gauge. The interesting node is that bright yellow one on the right. That is where we calculate the utilization from the stream of velocity signals that are entering the flow from those link nodes on the, on the left there. That yellow utilization node is an example of a user-defined node. It's defined by two files, an HTML file and a JavaScript file. 
The HTML provides the user interface for the node configuration, and the JavaScript implements the functionality of the node. Now, we haven't talked about configuration yet, right? So this is a good time for a little detour. This is the configuration panel for the utilization node. This is where we change that 0.1 that we picked earlier to another value. Once that's changed, then we would deploy that change to the runtime. In the red box are the edit fields for the properties of the node. Like any proper web app, it has validation, default values, and placeholder text. Now the purple box is the node help, which tells the user what the node does. This node has an example of some fairly common special treatment or special behavior. If the message that comes in has a property called reset, then the node clears out any internal data structures and in effect starts over. User-defined nodes have an HTML file and a JavaScript file. This HTML fragment defines the form fields and the help text. If you spent any time at all with HTML, then the divs and inputs won't be very interesting. What is exciting is the type attribute on the script tag. Props to anyone who needs to define their own MIME type. Now this is the other part of that HTML file. Notice that the script tag is just a boring old JavaScript MIME type. So this fragment sets up the visuals of the node, like color and icon, as well as the default values for the edit fields. Now, Node Red provides two validators, one for numbers and the other for strings. The strings one pretty much uses regular expressions. If you have a node that has some very specific editing needs, you can define your own validators and hook into the edit lifecycle with callbacks. At this point, the configuration editor is defined, but what is this node actually going to do? And for that, we need a little more JavaScript. I'm beginning to think of JavaScript as the uh, duct tape of the internet. So the first thing of interest here is this utilization function. This is a factory that creates the node and sets up an event listener for the input event. This factory gets registered by the, with the runtime by that last line. The other thing of interest here is the event handler. This is where the node actually does its work. In this case, it keeps track of the sum of the time differences between messages and the sum of the time differences where the value of the message was greater than our threshold. With each message that comes into the node, it updates the sums, calculates the on time divided by the total time, and sends the message on downstream. User-defined nodes are easier than it looked in the last few slides. They're a powerful tool, though, for building something that requires a lot of instances of the same node with potentially different configurations for each instance. Now, in this section, we're going to talk about the forecasting. We want to forecast the time until failure for the pump. Knowing when something is going to break allows you to plan ahead, replace the uh, asset on your time, and minimize costs and lost revenue and downtime. Now, just like in the utilization KPI, we'll pick an arbitrary threshold to indicate failure. Let's define failure as the point where the vibration signal is greater than 0.75. We want to know when the red trend line crosses over that threshold. The tricky part is that we want to know before it happens, preferably days before it happens. And we're going to do that by using a regression model. We're going to set the value to 0.75, and then we're going to solve for t. And that should tell us when the pump will fail. When the vibration isn't getting worse, the blue line won't cross the threshold for quite a while. However, when the vibration starts to change more dramatically, you can see how that green line will cross the threshold a whole lot sooner. 
Now, I know that there's someone in the audience thinking that looks like a parabola, just do a second order uh, regression, be done with it, and you're absolutely correct. However, this is fake, fake data that we're looking at here, and it's just meant to help me uh, visualize the KPI calculations. We'll take a look at some real fake data uh, a little later. So the three yellow nodes on the left are doing the processing of the data stream to get it ready for the next node there. The first one should be familiar. It's the low pass node that we saw in earlier flows. It's followed by two nodes that group messages together. Before I understood how the batch and join nodes worked, I wrote a user defined node that did the same thing. Not only was it easy, but it was totally unnecessary. The batch node adds a property to each message as it passes through that node. That property indicates the message's position in a specific group of messages. The join node then looks at that property and bundles all related messages into an array and sends the array downstream. The batch node allows you to configure the window size and if you need a rolling window, you can configure the size of the overlap. Now just like the smooth operator in the monitoring flow and the threshold value in the diagnostics flow, we can manipulate the batch node configuration and observe how those changes affect the outcome. Now the yellow regression node is a user-defined node that makes use of an NPM package. Packages are made available through the global context by requiring the package in the node red settings file. Here you can see that we set four properties on that global context. One string and the results of three calls to require. Those properties are available to all the user-defined nodes as well as all the function nodes in the system. Now this is the code for the regression node. The first thing that happens in the event handler is that we grab that regression package from that global context. The next bit of interest is that call to map that coerces the data from the, form that, uh, from the form that it's in to the form that the regression package needs. Recall that our messages have a timestamp and a payload properties, but the regression package wants that information as a list of lists. Don't get fooled by the order property of the options object. Yeah. It's ignored here because we're calling the linear function on the regression package. Now the regression package also has uh, exponential logarithmic power and polynomial regression models. Okay, after all that smoothing and regressioning, we can finally do some forecasting in this forecast node. This forecast node is implemented as a node red function node. A function node is like the event handler of a user-defined node. Now there's really only two things that are uh, going on here that are of much interest. First is that third line where we're using the coefficients of the regression model to figure out at what time the regression crosses that 0 0.75 threshold. The next thing of interest is the return statement. When you set the properties of a function node, you can define the output ports that that node will have. So far, all the user-defined nodes that we've looked at return a single message, but here we see the function is returning an array of messages. Each message in the array will be sent out a different port. And the first message has been formatted for that gauge widget and the second output was formatted for displaying the projected time of failure in a text widget. So there's a lot going on here. User-defined nodes, we already covered those. That regression node uses an NPM package to calculate the regression model. The forecast node is a function node. It runs some code for each message. And the forecast node is also sending messages out two different ports. So it seems like we've covered a lot of capabilities of Node-RED, but guess what? We're not done. 
I've mentioned a few times that one of the reasons to build a model is to have the ability to change the configuration of the model. It's the difference between these two models of the SR-71 Blackbird. The one on the left flies, the one on the right doesn't. It's the difference between a static and a dynamic model. At this point, our digital twin is a quasi-dynamic. We can change settings, like the utilization threshold, but then we have to deploy the change to the runtime. So in addition to data visualization nodes, the dashboard package also has data input nodes. These widgets allow us to change the behavior of the system by injecting messages into the flow. Those numeric uh, inputs on the right change the values of the utilization and failure thresholds. That drop down in the center is going to allow us to select different filters. And the button on the left is just going to reset everything to some moderately sane values. So the numeric inputs send a message each time you click on the up or down arrows, and the payload of the message is the new value of the control. That message is sent to a couple of downstream neighbors. A link node and a function node. The link provides a mechanism for alerting other flows that the value of the threshold has changed. And the function node takes the new value and stores it into the global context. Now each node has access to uh, three contexts, the global, the flow, and then one at the node level. This is how you share information between flows in the system. The utilization node was then refactored to read that threshold from this global context and to use that value in the calculation of the utilization API. So for selecting a filter, we have a drop-down node. Like the numeric input node, the drop-down node sends a message downstream every time its value changes. In this filter selector flow, the downstream neighbor of the drop-down is a function node. The selected filter is being saved to the flow's context where we'll use it to route data messages to the correct filter. Now the smooth node, which provides the different filtering functions, doesn't have the ability to set the filter type on the fly, so we need to use a different mechanism to provide multiple filters. The switch node, the one labeled route, is an example of sending a message out different ports based on a property. In this case, we are routing the messages according to the filter property of the flow context. Now the smooth node provides three different filters as well as a few statistics about the data stream. Here you can see that we've used three instances of the smooth node, each with different settings. Data messages come in through the link and get passed to the switch node which routes them to one of the filters. The filtered result is then made available to the other flows throughout the out, through that output link. Now you probably noticed that we had four options for the dropdown, but only three types of filter in the smooth node. The fourth filter is defined in a function node. Now you've seen the batch join sequence uh, before it's creating an array of messages. The median filter simply takes that array, sorts it, and returns the message that was in the middle. Since we're on the subject of user interfaces, what happens if the dashboard package doesn't have a widget you need? Well, you build one, of course. So I needed a way of displaying a bunch of messages which would emit a message when clicked. Basically, a list of buttons. It turns out that you can use Angular and Angular Material Directives in the template node, which is part of that dashboard package, and that is squishy.
Okay, we're going to try a little demoing here. Charts and whatnot are pretty, but uh, what if I'm not staring at the screen? I'd like some sort of notification, you know, when that time until failure is less than two. So there's nothing in the current model that will do remote notifications. Now, with node red, you do get a couple of nodes that uh, allow you to interface with email or Twitter, but that's only moderately fun. It's more fun to play with Play-Doh and Raspberry Pis. Well, that's cute. Apparently, uh, Play-Doh is slightly conductive. Wow, that's, that takes, that's, oh, it's shortened out the test pads on the back. Okay, well, let's try it this way. Come on, stand up there. There you go. Oh. Okay. So this is a Raspberry Pi. It has a, a Pi Maroni blink hat on it. That's uh, eight individually addressable LEDs with RGB goodness in them. It's controlled by, guess what, node red, running on the Pi Zero, and it's exposing some API endpoints. And this is the versatile thing that we were talking about. So let me configure my os oscillation overthruster for endothermic propulsion. And all right, now. Tell me it came up. Oh, okay. Awesomeness. So here's the model that I built. Let's go down here. We're going to add a flow. I want to grab those uh, messages coming out of that forecast flow. And for that, we're going to use an input link. And here's where we set some properties. And there is my forecast data. Next thing we want to do is say, I want to be notified two days before the pump fails. So we're going to filter out everything that is where the payload is, is greater than two, which means we're going to pass everything I have no idea why that happened. We're going to pass every message that is, no, we're going to pass, yes, less than or equal, that's right, Dan. We're going to pass every message that is below our threshold. So if the payload is less than or equal to two, we'll pass it on. Now we've linked it up, and the next thing is we're going to make an HTTP request to this little guy over here. And that is going to go to HTTP 192.168. Oh, thank you. Do I? Son of a gun. Thank you. I wouldn't get through this without you guys. HTTP 192, 168, 10, 1, going to the node red port. Dag nabbit. <laughs> and I still need a colon in there. Come on, guys. You're letting me slack off here. All right. And now API. Dag nabbit. API, okay, slash B A T T E R N. And we're going to try to kick off the rainbow pattern. All right, API pattern rainbow. And here's where we deploy it. Okay, successfully deployed. Wow. So this is the user interface. 
over on the right hand here, we see our uh, thresholds. This is where the data is actually going to show up. Here's where we're going to select our filter. And we're going to set it up for some, there we go, some. Okay. All right, here we go. Now you see Node-RED is uh, taking in the, that stream of data. Remember those, are, those messages have a payload and a timestamp. So it's basic time series data coming from this pump. Now we haven't, uh, we haven't yet hit our utilization threshold, but we can see that our forecasting node seems to be working. Oh, there goes the utilization. All right, so the longer it's on, the higher that utilization goes. Down, 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 and <laughs> and there it failed. Okay, I'm so <laughs> wow. Of all the demos I've seen today, that one went up pretty well. <laughs> all right. Um, so that's. Uh, let's see. Let me get back to my. Screen here, da, 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 da. And I am wondering if this will even work, but yeah, yeah well. Let's yeah. Well, if I can just as soon as I get it up on the screen for you, we'll be lucky, huh? Yeah, there we go. So my name's Dennis Dunn. Uh, there's some contact information up there. The code for this particular system is out there on GitHub. Um, I'm going to be here for a while. I sure would love to talk to you about Node-RED or digital signal processing, anything. Um, thanks for coming. I really appreciate it. Any questions? Okay. Like I say, come on down. Um, yeah? All oh, right. Awesome. Is, uh, is it based on, on Node? Yes, it is. Uh, this, I happen to have Node 6, I believe, uh, installed on my machine here. So it, gets, uh, it, it runs on Node. Uh, I assume that you're going to get all kinds of ES6 goodness in there, but I haven't really tried it yet. It's, I've all just been using, you know, old school required module.exports. What are the different ways we can get information into Node-RED? There is, I'm sorry? Ab, ab, it, let me, uh, yeah, <laughs> this is some good stuff here. There's some good stuff, man. Uh, okay, let's go back to, uh, there we go. All right, over here on the left-hand side, we have the toolbox. These are all of the different nodes that come out of the box with, uh, with Node-RED. Up here at the top, the streams, that's one I, that's, I, I wrote that, so uh, to help me play around with this. We have some input nodes here. Inject will uh, simply inject a message into the flow on a timed basis if you want. Uh, we have links. Uh, you mentioned Mosquito. Well, there's an MQTT queue right there. We have HTTP, WebSockets, TCP, UDP. There's all kinds of ways to get information in here. In fact, uh, one of the things I'm working on is a Mongo database for storing uh, time series data in which the interface to it is mosquito queues. Uh, output, we have a nice debug output. That's very handy. Function nodes, these are implement the actual uh, functionality of your flows. 
you will find that you will use these a lot and uh, even a function node will typically have just a few lines of code in it. Uh, here's some dashboard stuff. And there we go, social media. So you've got email input, output, Twitter input, output, uh, sentiment analysis. We've got uh, file inputs and outputs. So there's a lot of ways to get data actually into a Node-RED flow. Oh, I love those things, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. How is it deployed? How does it deploy when you push the button? Uh, that's a good question. I've never actually, it always worked, so I never actually thought about it, quite frankly. Um, this, uh, this web interface comes off of uh, localhost here. It's all running localhost. Um, when I hit the, de the, the deploy button, uh, presumably, it p sends the flow up the web sockets to the server end there that's running under node red. Running under node, let's see here, we have it? Yeah, we got it. So down here on the bottom is uh, my terminal session that has node red flowing. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we can show you some uh, other stuff here if you're interested. This is Blinky. This is running this little guy down here. And once again, this is Node Red uh, running. It's Node Red. I mean, what are you going to do? It's JavaScript, man. There's a JavaScript package that uh, lets me light up these uh, LEDs. It's kind of neat. Cylon. I really wanted to do a rainbow Cylon. Um, poor people who. Eh, I don't know where my camera is, so. Poor people at home aren't going to see the really good stuff. Oh, oh, nice. Sweet. Thanks, guys. So I really wanted to do like a Cylon rainbow thing going on there, but I didn't have time. So anyway, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for coming. You made it really easy for me. Thanks.